There is power in seeding. Very much. A seed is so powerful. But do not detach the seed from the word. The seed is the word. When we talk about the hundredfold, we are talking about the word of God producing in your life according to the capacity that it is meant to produce in your life. The parable is this. The seed is the word. When you sow money, it must be the word that propels you to do. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 pleasures of this life, the love for other things, the love for riches and all those things. Now it, 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 it takes you away from your focus. But when you now realize that the word of God is primary in my life and you seek for that word, you seek for that word. Let me tell you something. We must show a difference between us and the world. If you are a believer and you look at your own life, because the Bible tells us if we judge ourselves, we will not be judged by anybody if we judge ourselves. And then you look at the world and say, how am I different to the world? How am I different to the world? If the world is doing the same thing and you're doing exactly the same thing, what propels the world is what propels you. The world is what propels you. How the world reacts to the outcome of the election is the same way we respond. How we talk about the collapse of the collision talks is exactly the same way we talk about the world. The world talks about the same thing that we are. We see things the same way. Our lifestyle is the same. We respond the same way. We are all reacting to things. We are not creating anything. We are not initiating anything. We look at the circumstances. We see the same way. We analyze and interpret it the same way. How are we different to the world? How are we different to the world? Because we are here to impact the world. The world is not supposed to to impact us. Amen. Amen. So you must understand the difference between addition and multiplication. As a child of God, let God provide for you. Yes. But don't end with provision. It's for children. Yeah. Go beyond that and say, Lord, I want you to use me. Yes. And when you decide that I want God to use me, God is going to take you through a journey. That is why the things of God, and this is where you need to hear what this hundred, uh, reaching for the hundredfold, it's all about. The Bible in the book of Luke chapter 8, verse 11, put it there, in the, in the King James Version. It says, the parable is this, the seed is the word. Let me say it again. Luke 8, verse 11, it says, the parable is this. The seed is the word. So there are many people that are sowing stuff, but they are not attached to the word. There is power in seeding. Very much. A seed is so powerful. But do not detach the seed from the word. Everything that you are sowing must be propelled by the word. It is the word that will endure. It is the word that will last. Hallelujah. When you want to give up, it is the word. 
in you that will endure and keep you standing. And it is the word at the end of the day that is going to produce, you understand? The seed is the word. When we talk about the hundredfold, we are talking about the word of God producing in your life according to the capacity that it is meant to produce in your life. The seed is the word. The parable is this, the seed is the word. The word must be what propels you to do what you do. When you sow money, it must be the word that propels you to do. Listen, sowing, sowing is not limited to money. That is why one of the key scriptures that is used for sowing is Luke 6.38. Luke 6.38 says, Given it shall be given back to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give to your, to your bosom. With the same measure you use, it shall be measured back to you. That is not, actually that scripture is not even talking about money. When you read before that, it says, judge not and you shall not be judged. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Hallelujah. But what propels you? When you forgive, what propels you to forgive? What propels you to forgive? Listen, I have seen that, let me tell you, the things of God work very well. And the seed is how the kingdom of God operates. So, but it is for the mature. Say for the mature. Someone who understands how the kingdom of God works. That is why Jesus says, how hard is it for those who trust in their riches to enter the kingdom of God? Why? Because those who trust in their riches, they cannot get involved in the things of the kingdom to the full magnitude to which God requires them to get involved. Why? Why? Because they do not understand that in the kingdom of God, it's all about a seed. The Bible says the kingdom of God is like a man who scatters seed on the ground. That's the kingdom of God. It works like that. The kingdom of God, everything that you do, bear in mind, positive or negative, that do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. It is the law of multiplication. It's established like that. It's established like that. It remains like that. It stands. If you go around cheating, you're going to be cheated. It's a fact. You're going to be cheated. If you go around not forgiving people, when it is time for you to get your forgiveness, you will not be forgiven. You will not be forgiven. Let me tell you something, I, I, and I'm not bragging by this. It flows natural with me. I just can't keep grudges. And people, when I've wronged them, they don't take long to forgive me. How long do they take to forgive you? I mean, they don't take time to forgive me. They always forgive me. Always. And I never struggle to say to someone I'm sorry. Even when I know I'm not wrong. I forgive very easy. And I get forgiven so easy. Sometimes I will be in meetings and I will be so robust. So robust. Where other people's feelings get offended. And I, and I could tell that guy was offended with what I said. You know, it's nothing personal. Nothing personal. And I'll pick up a call and phone and say, Hey, I saw that you didn't like what I said. Yeah, and I'm like, but I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you. No, I know you. There's no way you could have meant to hurt me. In a short space of time, we're friends again. I go to court and I argue cases vehemently. And I become robust when I fight for my clients. But within the bounds, within the limits, and I will see my colleague was offended. I make sure that immediately court finishes, I don't leave without going to them so that they know it's not personal. Even if I was playing soccer, I used to be called Caetano when I played soccer. I was playing number seven, a fast striker. I would leave someone and they fall. After scoring, I'll go and, 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 and make them feel good. Hallelujah. Even if I was a defender, if I rough someone, I, would go, I was going to go to them and say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to rough you. I, I, I thought I was aiming for the ball, but your leg just happened to be on the way. Do you understand what I'm trying to say to you? Church, let me tell you something. You must live life understanding the law of multiplication if God is going to use you. Because God uses you perfectly when you operate in the surplus. When you, do not, you are not in the surplus yet, you need to still learn to operate the principle. But when you operate the principle, your motive is very crucial. Because if your motive is to get the multiplication, you are not going to sustain that. Your motive must be love. Your motive must be, I'm here to be used by God. 
and you operate that principle knowing as a distribution center, as a money missionary, I will never lack for seed. God provides seed to the one who sows, and the one who sows, he multiplies it. Amen. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 10, he multiplies it. You know, one of the things I give the most is clothes. I give clothes so much, so much. It has always been my life. I always give clothes. And my wardrobes, no matter how much I increase them, they are always packed. My suits are not breathing where they are. I will empty them within a short space of time. They are packed again. And I never struggle to buy them. I never struggle to buy them. I always find them where you cannot find them. Why? I operate the principle. And I don't give because I want to get more. I already have more. I give because I just love to share. And sometimes the Lord will tell me, take that nice suit. I remember I had this orange one. Uh, Basalane, one of my best. God will say, take it and give it. And he would take those colorful ones. I used to wear colorful suits before I came to BGC. Red, green, like deep. Yeah, God will say, go take that one. That one that you love. And I would gladly do it within a short space of time. You operate the principle, it will work. But what's your motive? Your motive must be the love of God controls me. I love people. I just want to make a difference in the lives of others. I just want God to use me for his glory. Hallelujah. And change your goal. Change your goal. Unbelievers talk about themselves. They talk about what they have and what they have accomplished. No. We change that. We change that. Take it the other way around. We're no longer talking about what we have accomplished. We talk about what God has used us to accomplish stuff for others. That must be our driving force. Hallelujah. We must go back to the days of the early church. Where the Bible says the early church believers, they were not controlled about the stuff that they had. They were controlled and impelled by making a difference in the lives of others. Let me go down, down to a close. I'm going to talk about a few, a few characters as we go to the close. But let me read Luke 8. Luke 8, 15. In the TPT. It says, the seed that fell into deep, okay, the seed that fell into good, fertile soil represent those lovers of truth who hear it deep within their hearts. They respond by clinging to the word, keeping it clear or, or dear, I mean, as they endure all things, underline that, as they endure all things in faith. When there is no word, so the seed is not the word, but you are trying to give, the demands for other things will call. The demands for other things will call. When you decide that I want to forgive, you know, um, I don't know if the lady is here, so I was, on Friday I was praying for uh, our last day of prayer and fasting because we're doing it close and personal this time, ministering to personal. So as the lady is coming, the Lord shows me that this lady, there is so much that is blocked in her life and it's because she's harboring unforgiveness. And as I pray for her and I tell her, lady, the Lord is telling me that you are living in the past. Let go. Let go. She started weeping. And I kept ministering to her and said, let go and let God. Let go and let God take over from where you are. In those situations, church, I tell you, she can make a decision Said, I've heard the pastor speak. I know that I'm harboring unforgiveness and these things is tying me back to the past because I've been hurt so badly. And she says, I want to forgive. It's a decision that is void of the word. She's not going to go far. The next time when she goes at Mall of Africa and she meets that guy, unforgiveness kicked in double from the time that I gave her the word to say forgive. Why? Because there is no word. Don't try to forgive without the word. Forgive because you have been forgiven much. 
forgive because you understand that what, Christ, what happened to Christ cannot be compared to what happens to me. I've never needed to sweat blood when I need to compromise anything. Yeah. Jesus Christ sweat blood. Yeah. That's the highest level of stress. You understand? Yeah. The word of God must be your encouragement. If the word of God is not your encouragement, it is the word of God that gives you the capacity to enjoy in the decision that you have taken to say, I want to walk in this path and there is nothing that will take me out of it. It must only be the word, not the decision that you make. If it's the decision that you make, you're not going to go far. This verse says, they respond by clinging to the word, keeping it dear as they enjoy all things in faith. This is the seed that will one day bear much fruit in their lives. Hallelujah. That is the hundredfold we're talking about. It will come when you decide to keep the word first place in your heart. And no matter what happened, you hold on to the word. No matter what happened, you hold on to, to the word. It is the word that is going to sustain you, nothing else. The parable is this, the seed is the word. If you do not know the word, the level through which God can use you is very limited. There is a place you cannot go beyond. If the word is, is not, that has not taken root in your life. Now, the Bible talks about a, a, a man called Joseph, Joseph, in the book of Acts, chapter, chapter, chapter 4. Now, Joseph, this guy was nicknamed Barnabas by the apostle. Barnabas means son of encouragement. Son of encouragement. Son of encouragement, Barnabas. His name was Joseph. They, they nicknamed him son, uh, uh, son of encouragement or son of consolation because of the kind of person he was. He was such a pillar. He was such a pillar. You know, um, there's a man I know who... His spiritual parents called him a son of encouragement. And for a long time, I thought they meant, they, they named him a son of encouragement because of his generosity and the, and the love for the things of God. But later on, I realized that his generosity and love for the things of God was propelled by the word. To be called a son of encouragement, it means it is not a once-off event. It is your lifestyle. When you are called a son of encouragement, it means it is your lifestyle. There is always light around you. Your life encourages others. Your life encourages others. And look at this. This man, Barnabas, was called a son of encouragement by his leaders. And then I, 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 I found a scripture, Acts chapter 11, verse 24, where the Bible shows the distinction for this guy. He was full of the word and was full of the Holy Spirit. Amen. They call him a son of encouragement because he was full of the word and full of the Holy Spirit. And something very interesting Something very interesting. So God calls him for the gospel. God says to the apostles, he says, separate for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Remember, Barnabas is not his name. His name is Joseph. The apostles nicknamed him Barnabas because he was an encouragement. But look at God when he shows up. He doesn't call him Joseph. He calls him by his calling because his name reflected his calling. Amen. All of us who must have names in the spirit that sums up our calling. That when God looks at you, you are what he has placed you to be. Sons of encouragement are not only in the church. In your family, you become a son or a daughter of encouragement. 
when your mother and your father look at you and say, this surely is a son of my encouragement. Yeah. Your father and your mother give you a nickname in their hearts because of their work, of your works and the things you do. Do you know that this is how God sees you? This is how God sees you. The Bible talks about so many characters in the scriptures. Listen, it's profitable to serve God. It is profitable for you to walk in your calling. There are certain things that God will call you to do that becomes a distinction in your life when you learn to submit yourself to him. You remember uh, the, the woman who had her last meal. Do you remember? Yeah. Whom God sent Elijah to her at Zarephath. Remember that woman? Yeah. Uh, Elijah says to her, give me water. As she goes to get water, he says, no, give me um, a morsel of bread also. She says, man, you see me gathering sticks? I'm going, to, I'm going to cook something for me and my boy. And we are dying after that. There is nothing left. He says, don't worry. Do what you have said, but give it to me first. Guess what? She did that. The Bible says that a meal did not run out, but that's not where I, I, I am. It came to pass that a son died. A son died. What happened? That son was brought back to life. Let's rewind. They both would have died if they, when there was that moment, that Kairos moment. This is the only event that is recorded about this woman. The only event, the only event recorded in the Bible. It was that Kairos moment where God said, this is what I need from you. And she obeyed. Yeah. When she obeyed, that became a mark. A son died later. The son was raised from the dead. If they died of hunger, would they have been raised from the dead? Both of them would have perished. How many people at that time, you think she was the only person in the neighborhood who did not have food? Many people died. But they never raised to life. The Bible talks about Dorcas. How many of you heard about Dorcas in the scriptures? Amen. Dorcas died. You know what happened to Dorcas? After she died, the Bible says that those people that were with her, they heard that Peter was coming. They sent a message and said, Peter, come in haste. Because they wanted to, Peter to pray for her. They believed she was going to be raised to life. Guess what? When Peter and the apostles came, the Bible says the widows in that neighborhood, they came with the stuff that Dorcas did for them. They came with the stuff. As they are coming with the stuff, they were showing the works of this woman. Because listen, as believers, we are called for good works. Our righteousness is destined to produce good works. If I say I'm the righteous person, but there is no good works, I mean, it's a festive season now. This is the time for our righteousness to bear fruit. There are so many people, I'm not even talking about the world, in your own family who do not have money for food. There are brothers and sisters that you have who, who are not employed. Their children don't have clothes for Christmas. If God can only use you to make a difference in their lives, your righteousness bearing fruit, hallelujah. One day when they hear you are sick, that family is going to pray, say, Lord, not this one. You cannot take this one, not this one. The Bible talks about the Shunammite woman. As a matter of fact, with Dorcas, the Bible, the scripture tells us when you go and read about Dorcas, the Bible says that this woman, she was full of good works. Listen, when she gave to those widows, she was not thinking that she was going to die one day and she will need to be resurrected to life. She was propelled. She just loved people. She enjoyed sowing those things and giving the offense because these were widows. She dedicated herself. Do you think it just came out of her mind? No. It was God who gave her a calling to say, you are going to look after these widows. And when she died, she was raised back to life. The Shunammite woman, it was the same thing. The Bible says the man of God used to pass there and it came to a spirit that, no, man, let's provide for this man of God. I like what happened to the story of the Shunammite woman. Two things happened. Firstly, after she has built that upper room for them and they come and they eat, and they are refreshed. They say to her, what do you want us to do for you? I want you to understand the message I'm preaching. The Shunammite woman says, I live among my own people. I'm fine. I didn't do it because I want something to be done for me. She never told them anything. 
yet she did not have a child. She didn't even tell them that, oh, I have a child if the man of God can lay hands on me and prophesy that I get a husband. No. No. When you do something for God, detach it to your needs. Leave your needs to God. It was, it was Gehazi who told Elisha that, by the way, this woman, she does not have a child. And that child later died. That child later died. Guess what? That child was raised back to life. What am I saying to you? There's profit in serving God. Amen. There's profit in you being driven by divine purpose and get involved in something that is bigger than you. If there are unbelievers that are doing these things that we are supposed to do, we are not doing them. We are in the kingdom washed by the blood of Christ. If you are here, or maybe you are watching us on television, but you are not born again, I just want to pray for you today and give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Life begins when you say yes to Jesus. When you say yes to Jesus, it comes into your heart. The Holy Spirit shares his love in your heart that will now propel and compels you. And everything in your life change. You begin to hear the voice of God and understand the things of God. And that is where divine direction comes in and you discover the path which God has prepared for you. So make this prayer with me, believing that when Jesus died on the cross, he was dying for you. Say, Lord Jesus, say it with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying for me on the cross. Today, I open my heart. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. I thank you, Lord, that I'm born again. My name is written in the book of life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you made that prayer, you are born again. You are my brother, you are my sister. I will see you in heaven. Hallelujah. Hello, TBN family. This is Pastor Kenny Mukwena from Blessed Generation Church. Unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor everlasting father prince of peace and of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end i just want to take this time to wish you and your family a safe festive season merry christmas and a prosperous new year you know festive season is a time for us to relax you know spend time with our family enjoy christmas exchange festivities and i pray that as you do that may the spirit of christmas Feel you to overflow. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Enjoy.